Well, uh, Prynhaw Dai, iawn i chi gyd. Uh, ymraint i'r Prynhaw yma, yw cael estyn croeso cynnes iawn i chi. Uh, unwaith yn rhagor i ysblander uh, llyfrgell y sylweinwyr yma ar gampws Prifysgol Cymru y Drynod Dewi Sant yma yn Llanbed. A hynny ar gyfer y drydedd mewn cyfres o ddarlithoedd agoriadol gan academyddion a anrydeddwyd a theithl athro gan y Prifysgol. Honorary guests, colleagues, friends, it is my very great privilege this afternoon to extend to you all once again a very warm welcome to the splendid 
uh, surroundings here of the Founders Library here on the Lampeter campus, University of Wales, uh, Trinity St David. For this, the third in a series of inaugural lectures to be delivered by academics who have recently received professorial titles from the university. This afternoon's inaugural lecture will be delivered by Professor Louise Steele, Professor of Near Eastern Archaeology, based here on the university's Lampeter campus. And the university is delighted that so many of you have been able to join Professor Steele on this very special occasion, either here or indeed uh, in the virtual room. And I understand some 25 or 30 individuals have joined us uh, in the virtual room this afternoon. I am reliably informed as well that the audience includes some of Professor Steele's uh, Cypriot colleagues, colleagues and research students here at the university, as well as uh, Professor Steele's partner, Steve Koisor Benigyaun Ichefe Aprinhaunma Atoni. At this stage, usually uh, the Vice Chancellor will be here to say a few words, um, but unfortunately he's been uh, held up in Birmingham and he sends his sincere apologies. So we'll crack on. <laughs> if we may. Um, as I've uh, mentioned uh, at previous uh, events, an inaugural lecture is an occasion of significance in an academic staff member's career at the university. It provides our professors with the opportunity to share their achievements in research, innovation, engagement and teaching act activities before an audience of members of the university community and the general public. And this afternoon, it is the turn of Professor Louise Steele to deliver her inaugural lecture, having been awarded a professorship by the university in recent months. Professor Steele graduated with a first class degree in archaeology of the East Mediterranean from the University of Liverpool in 1988, before completing a PhD at University College London in 1993. Her doctoral studies focused on burial customs in Cyprus at the transition from the Bronze Age to the Iron Age. Between 1995 and 1998, she held a British Academy postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Edinburgh, having previously worked part-time as a lecturer in classical archaeology at the University of Reading. From Edinburgh, she moved to Israel, where she was appointed as acting director of the then British School of Archaeology in Jerusalem, now known as the Kenyan Institute before joining the academic staff here in Lampeter in the year 2000. Her research focuses on the archaeology of the East Mediterranean, and in particular that of Cyprus, where she's been involved in a number of research projects over the years. During this afternoon's lecture, Professor Steele will journey through her research, focusing on three key areas which have shaped her scholarship. Her, her archaeological work with communities in contested uh, landscapes such as Gaza and Cyprus, her work in understanding people's social lives through their material culture, and finally, new materialisms embedding people in the world and working with materials. Colleagues, friends, it gives me great pleasure to invite Professor Louise Steele to deliver her inaugural professorial lecture entitled An Archaeological Odyssey or Gaza Igamri. Troisa, welcome. Jochen uh, Grillim, and Kroiso, everyone, thank you very much for coming. I really appreciate having so many friends, colleagues and students, especially students in the audience with me. It's re really lovely to see you and it is a great honour and a privilege to be able to give this talk today. So um, I have to say, when I started, well, I started thinking about what I was going to talk to you all about, I found it very difficult to focus in on a specific aspect of my research that I could um, develop over 20 minutes, half an hour, five days, I don't know, <laughs> see how long it takes me to get through it. And I, I've, I felt that none of them would do justice to the very many different archaeological adventures I've had. And I thought it'd be really interesting, perhaps, because everyone's coming from such different 
audiences. We are a very multidisciplinary campus on Lampeter and I wanted to maybe just um, show you a little bit of how I've become the archaeologist and the scholar that I am today. So take you on a little bit of an adventure with me, starting off from where I started in Gaza when I had my interview um, back in 2000 and I'm hoping um, my colleague Christine Barsley from the British Council is here because she very kindly lent me her office in Gaza for my telephone interview. So I wasn't actually even in Wales at the time. So I started off or Gaza and I ended up in Gumri, <laughs> definitely. Um, and this is just to give you a snapshot of Gaza. Um, this is actually ancient Gaza. This is a wonderful site that if ever it became safe to go back there and work there again, um, this is the site that I would love to see excavated. It's called Tel Rakesh, and it's a couple of kilometres, or maybe a kilometre or so south of the Wadi Gaza. And everything you can see there, that is all fired mud brick, um, destruction layers, there's a sort of layer of ash and lens and um, sort of occupation layers. And you walk along the top of that sort of mound where all those people are standing and you can just see the outline of buildings in the mud brick and it's just so exciting. I really hope it's still there. I hope it hasn't been bulldozed or bombed. I hope it's still there as an archaeological site because that was the one that I fell in love with. It's not the one that we explored but that's just to give you a sense of um, Gaza and I will come back to the role that Gaza has played in me as an academic. So hopefully Um, what I want to take you through today is, um, I've got three main areas, I've actually slipped in the next one that I didn't tell Grulim about, um, contested landscapes, which um, for some reason my archaeological career has embedded me in various contested landscapes. I primarily work in Cyprus, um, which is a divided island, uh, and I work in the southern part of the island. I've only been to the north a couple of times. Um, so I only really know a part of the island. We work very close to the Green Line. That's the site I've been excavating with my partner, Steve Thomas, a place called Radio Vupes, um, which many of you have heard a lot about in previous talks. So I won't focus in on that. Um, also in Gaza, and I think also I've come to work in a contested landscape. We're in Wales. We know the importance of language, the importance of Welsh. And apologies for not being able to deliver this in fluent Welsh, but uh, um, so we know the importance of landscapes which are colonised um, and appropriated by other peoples and that's very important to me um, and that's where I think the community comes in and that's where post-colonial approaches comes in, thinking about how people negotiate living in a contested landscape. So those are a couple of things I want to talk about and then actually my real passion, the thing I'm really interested in is what people do with the material world, how we create the world around us through working with different types of substances to create the things and the objects which are meaningful for us, um, which shape our lives, um, shape the people that we are, how we project images of ourselves. And I've got two very ver different versions of that um, on the screen here. At the top is the first thing that I ever published as an object from Cyprus uh, back in the 1990s, which I was given permission by the director of Calabasos, um, Dr. Alison South, to discuss this object. It's a Mycenaean crater, it's for mixing wine and water, and it's a centerpiece of an elaborate feasting occasion. And it shows a wonderful scene, a very strange scene of a woman sitting in what I would describe as being probably a sacred building. It's topped with horns of consecration, which is how people would, in the Aegean, would ch um, map a sacred building. Um, and it's a very strange object. It's completely and utterly unusual, I was going to say completely unique, it is unique in Cyprus and that was um, the starting of my interest with objects and object worlds. Um, but the stuff that I'm really in love with is the collection of pots down at the bottom which do figure in quite a lot of our university publicity and um, very frequently turning up in uh, student guides to the campus and this is stuff that we excavated at Radio in this room here that you can see a couple of our students from um, Lampeter excavating and that is that is the pots and pans and the Tupperware and the daily life of people in the late Bronze Age that is the sort of stuff that the equivalents of us in the late Bronze Age would have been 
um, dealing with, especially the women. We'd been doing all the washing up and the cleaning and um, doing um, doing things to that pottery. And that to me tells a story. And I know I'm looking at Saskia and Bronwyn and Evie, who've all heard the stories of those pots and, and the Friday afternoon pots. So that's the thing I could, I could spend a whole afternoon talking to you about that. So we shall scamper on from there. But oh, yes, and that's materiality. The new materialisms is something for the last slide. I won't tell you about that until we get there. So starting off then with contested landscapes, as I said, I've worked in various landscapes which are contested. And when I um, was interviewed to come here to Lampeter, I was actually working in Gaza, uh, excavating with my colleague uh, Joanne Clark, um, a late Bronze Age site um, just north of the Wadi Gaza, a site that had been discovered with the um, bulldozing of uh, sand dunes in that area and it was completely and utterly unknown and a really really fascinating site because it tells the story of Egyptian military activity in the area. It tells us about uh, Tutmosis III who was the Egyptian aggressive go-get to establish an empire in the Levant pharaoh um, and his wicked auntie Hatshepsut she turns up there as well. Um, we'll be meeting them uh, shortly um, and it tells us about how even in the 14th century um, BC or 15th, 15th, 14th century BC, this bit of Gaza was contested. It was um, a place of military occupation. And we were also working in a place which in the modern world is contested and getting into Gaza in the 1990s, which is when we were working there, was difficult. It was safe. It was in the brief periods um, between the two intifadas. So it was a safe place to go at the time. It was a fascinating place to go at the time and I learned so much and I do not think I would be the archaeologist I am today and the scholar I am today if I hadn't started off there because Gaza really um, gave me the understanding that it is important not just to excavate stuff, not just to record stuff and to go away and leave it uh, and write various academic tomes about it, but actually to engage with the people whose archaeology you're excavating. Um, and especially important in a place where archaeology was a luxury. Doing archaeology is a Western white middle class privilege. It isn't something that is accessible to most of the inhabitants of Gaza, where actually just having food and drink and an electricity supply and water was enough for them to negotiate. So what we found when we were working there was that there was a lot of interest in what we were doing, especially amongst the middle class Gazans who, to be perfectly honest, were the ones that we mainly interacted and engaged with. But they were absolutely fascinated um, by the fact that we were being able to reveal their history. We worked very closely with the British Council in Gaza, um, and via the British Council in Gaza, we were able to do an exhibition called An Illustrated History of Gaza. And you can see an uh, unlikely group of suspects there, myself and Joe at the front, and um, various colleagues from the British Council and from the American School of Oriental Research, all there in the background, who um, helped us in setting up this exhibition, which was funded by the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, supported by, um, hosted by the British Council, um, and made accessible to Gaza. And Mahmoud Hawari at the end um, translated our guide to the exhibition. And that was where it really struck me that this was a place with a difficult history because the moment you start writing about what happened in Gaza, going back to the third millennium BC, it is a story of an army after an army, after an army, occupation after occupation after occupation. And that's where sort of giving back became important. And I think we did very well in terms of giving back. This is pre-impact. This is those glorious days where you could write a research grant proposal and get a research without having to make it relevant to the rest of the world. You could just talk to your colleagues in another ivory tower somewhere else. And it was a lot easier for an academic rather than having to think about impact. But there we were thinking about impact. I think we in Gaza invented impact in 1996, 97, when we did that exhibition. So I think that's one of our mini claims to fame. And um, yes, that set me off on the importance of working with the local community. And another story that I have, which made it very important for me about working with the local community was what was happening when we were surveying the site that we were look looking at. Um, the, there was a Bedouin family living on the site and they were lovely and they helped us and the 
the, um, the father of the family, Yusuf, he was our site guard and the children would tell us when we were surveying that we were surveying in the wrong place because the archaeology was all the way over there. And we were saying we've got to survey here to demonstrate that there isn't any archaeology here. And so, so we had the lovely interaction with them and they would show us all sorts of things that they had found um, and we would record it, take a photograph maybe draw it, um, keep a record of it and give it back to them. And then one day they showed us a lovely basalt tripod vessel, very typical of the Chalcolithic in the Near East. And we were looking at it and we were getting ready to take the photograph, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And Ardal, the local representative for the Palestine um, Department of Antiquities, confiscated it there on the spot. We never saw another thing ever again. What we found, what we excavated, we saw anything else that they had, they just kept quiet. And that made me realize, actually, you have to listen to people. You have to respect that it's their archeology. span You have to understand that you're working in somebody else's country, dealing with the their archeological heritage, their histories, and you have to make what you're doing accessible to them. So that I think sort of actually makes me quite typical of a Lampeter um, academic. I think we all have that sort of understanding of the importance of community. Um, and this became even more important when we moved over to Cyprus. Going to Gaza became very difficult. Moving to Cyprus, um, Cyprus is really the heart of my research. I love Cyprus. It is part of me. It's part of what made me an academic. Um, and we went back there and supported by so many members of the academic community in the Department of Antiquities. In particular, we set up an excavation in the northern part, well, the northern part of the Trodos Mountains. Um, but still in southern Cyprus, exploring a late Bronze Age farming settlement, which was apparently, as far as we can tell, established to support the developing copper mines on the island in the late Bronze Age. And what we found, and this is something that Steve in particular knows, is the importance of working with the local community, of sharing what you're doing, of showing what you're doing on a daily basis. We had people from the village coming out and working with us. The children used to come and pot wash with us, or they sort of come and sieve with us on site. And um, we built a very, very strong relationship with um, various members of the community, um, which persists to this day. And we felt we wanted to give something back. And also we started hearing all sorts of really interesting stories about the local past and local stories, which had nothing to do with the remote past, but really shaped our understanding about where we were working and what we were dealing with. And we felt, well, this is really interesting, you know, sort of finding out these stories about Cyprus in the 19th century and the 20th century, and obviously the mid 20th century Cyprus being British, difficult territory to negotiate. Um, so stories about Aoka. And we, we started thinking, well, this is really, really fascinating. We, we, we can do something with this. And this was the inception of um, the Hidden Past project, which was funded by the AHRC. It's part of their Care for the Future grant, um, where we really tried to um, find a way in which we could um, articulate the, the ancient history to the local community in a way that was um, meaningful for them and related to their sense of identity and sense of self, but also related it to the stories that they were telling us about their more recent histories. So really trying to make a connection between the distant past and the present past. And we did find that over the years that the discussions that we were having in the cafeteria at night um, became more informed that there was a real understanding about how old Radio was, um, what was happening there, rather than how much is something worth, which is one of the first questions we were asked, is sort of what is it worth intellectually? What is this telling me about my past and about me being Greek or being Cypriot or um, and being from Radio? And what is this telling me about what my ancestors did? So we really found that the the um, the narratives that were coming back to us we're changing as we talk to people and with the Hidden Past project this really really developed because we spent a lot of time working with the local school and this is an exhibition that we did at the local school um, as part of the Hidden Past project and we have all the school children there. This is some of the um, amazing material uh, that we excavated and again I'd like the stuff that is really embedded in people's daily lives so these are grinding stones these are the querns that Hazel and I are going to be thinking about on Saturday it's a tear glass open um, open day um, these are the things which we've 
for the most part being used to grind the daily bread, uh, to create the food um, that would be sustaining the local community, but also sustaining possibly the nearby farm, um, copper mining communities. This one here, the grinding stone, I, I defy anyone to actually grind grain on that. I think that is actually a copper, um, copper processing stone. Um, we found it down a well, uh, about halfway down a well, the well was just over five metres deep. If Steve hadn't been there, I don't think we would ever have got it out of the well. It was uh, uh, quite an interesting um, exercise to get them out. And so we took this into the school. We were telling them about the history about, of the site, what we found at the site. Ros came on one occasion. She told, told us the children about the animal bones that we'd excavated and what this was telling them about the farming activities at the site. And the children all had to go at grinding grain on the grinding stones. And we saw after a couple of these sessions, some of the work that the school children were producing about the archeology span of their site. So we really felt that we, we were contributing to their narrative um, and contributing to their understanding of their past. And we've gone back sort of up long after this um, project and spoken to um, people who were school children at the time who sort of tell us about their memories and, um, and what they got out of that. So I think that for me is um, something which is really, really important. And I think the students who had the opportunity to go out there, they learnt a lot from this very close um, engagement with the local community. Um, and it's a privilege to be able to do that. So that's, I think, my first little bit of an adventure that I want to talk about Gaza and a later inception of it in, in Cyprus. And thinking about these areas as being contested landscapes sort of been something that's very important with me. I, I've also over the years um, adopted the mantle of being uh, the departmental theoretician, the person who does the theory module and um, fallen more and more in love with theory over the years. So that's a little bit of Lampeter giving back to me. But um, one of the things that struck me was I'm working in a, a landscape which has been contested since time immemorial, in particular in Gaza. And what do local people do to negotiate um, being in a contested landscape, having another power come in, impose their will and their authority on you, demonstrate it through their architecture, um, through their armies moving through there for you having to pay taxes to them? How do you actually negotiate um, being colonised? Very pertinent question for West Wales, I think, as well, but very, very, very important. And I, as an archaeologist, like um, working in largely proto historic places, I can't go and ask the people, I can't listen to their voices, but I can listen to the voices of the objects that they made and they used. And this for me has become a very important approach. So I'm really thinking about the material consequences of living in an occupied territory and how people negotiate that and how they take the exotic, the foreign, and work it into something that um, allows their own identity to come through. So <coughs> there are a number of things which have sort of informed my understanding of this. One of them is the idea of the middle ground. And this is something which was developed by an American anthropologist looking at Algonquin Indians and their trade with um, Europeans back in the 17th century and how um, you see a sharing of ideas and a sharing of social practices and exchanges, exchanges of material culture which become reinvented and create a new social world that people might be using the same type of objects but they're translating them, they're doing it differently. Um, this is something that Kopitos talks about, it's not the fact that they're adopted but the way that they're culturally redefined and put to use is important. And this became sort of the thing that I thought I can really focus in on. So Gaza was the first place that I sort of played around with this idea of thinking about um, a, material, a middle ground, a place where people come into contact with each other, they share ideas, they share objects, they, they do things together. And you have a choice, you have agency in what you adopt and what you reject, that you, you are able to do this to shape your own new material world. And the thing which took us to Gaza were these little objects here. Um, and these are um, clay objects, they, they're the end of clay cones, which would have been about 
30 centimeters or so in length. Um, they're all broken off uh, around about 10 centimeters and it looks like these are things that have been set into an architectural facade and at some point the architectural facade had been destroyed, they were lopped off and they were dumped in the site that we were excavating. We found, well we didn't find most of these, these were found by the Department of Antiquities, uh, Maureen Sardek in Gaza um, in survey work um, and we've catalogued and published them all. We found fragments from these objects. We found one tip of the cone from the other end and these are quite interesting objects. These are unique in the Levant. There are no other examples of them, only from the site we were working at, the site called El Maraca. Um, and the only parallel to these objects comes from Egyptian Thebes and from Nubia, uh, and dating to the 18th dynasty. And in Egyptian Thebes, these objects, or the, the Egyptian versions of these, were set into the, around the facade, around the doorway, into the tombs of nobles. And they would have complex inscriptions over the round face, which would be projecting out of the architectural facade, usually telling us the story about the person who was buried there, their name, um, their official position, their relationship to the pharaoh, just a, and a little bit of a bibliography about them, their little bio blurbs for, for the afterlife. Um, what we have is something that we can't demonstrate as funerary, but otherwise actually matches these objects. Um, in terms of form and apparently in function they do appear to have been broken off from an architectural facade uh, and there is an inscription on the front face uh, this one here says men uh, and that is the egyptian name the the um, of the pharaoh Thutmose the third the big pharaoh goes over creates an empire in the well really establishes the empire goes tramping around the levant uh, and uniquely on ours, this doesn't happen on the Egyptian ones, on the upper, upper side, so the person in the same alignment to this, um, got the same representation of the name being stamped there. And this is something some of our students have done. We've made examples of these. We've got a little um, wooden press and we, we do this in clay and have a go at trying to recreate these objects. Um, so, so yes, Thomas is the third, but Thomas is the third is one of those pharaohs that you can't quite trust his name. Because he's, his name is there, it doesn't mean to say that he was there. It's one of those names that pops up long after he's popped his clogs and gone off into the afterlife. He turns up again and again. It's one of those really, really um, important names for the Egyptians. So, so it, it circulates and things with, his, things with his name written on them circulate for generations and generations after his death. So we were thinking, OK, we've got Thutmose the third, we've got these strange objects, how can we make sense of them? When we were conserving these um, as part of our excavation project, we found this one here and it says Mart Kare. Um, can't really see all of it, but you've got the feather of the uh, goddess Mart, which sits on a headdress and underneath there, so you can see Mart just about there sitting down under, underneath her is car. We haven't got the ray and that one there that we have here, so that's a ra sign. Mark Kare is Hatshepsut. Now Hatshepsut and Thutmose the Third have a co-regency. After she dies, Hatsh um, Thutmose the Third really didn't like his auntie, really didn't want her to be remembered, and the most powerful way of killing someone, making sure they don't have an afterlife, is to destroy their name. We destroy their name, you really are killing them for an Egyptian. It is sort of double, double death. So Hatshepsut's name has largely been erased from Egyptian monuments. So the fact that we got them both together actually demonstrates that this is contemporary to the co-regency of Hatshepsut and Thutmose III, otherwise there's no way that cone would be there. So it doesn't quite fit in what we know about Egyptian activity, military activity by Thutmose III, because that happens in year 22 of his reign. So this is a little bit earlier, but it seems to demonstrate that there's something going on just north of the Wadi Gaza at the site of El Maraca during the co-regency. And you've got this, this, these objects. So we're thinking, well, what are they? And what are they doing? They're marking a building, might be a funerary building. Maybe it's the tomb of the governor of Gaza, who knows? Maybe it's a building which projects Egyptian authority. And also, these are signs which, even if you can't read hieroglyphs, 
you can sort of recognise them. They'll be recognisable to you. If you're a Canaanite in Gaza, wandering around, you see that, it will tell you, yeah, this is the, the this is royal authority. You might not know that it says Pat Moses III or Menkepere, but you'll know it's Egyptian royal authority. So you thought, okay, this is sort of interesting. So is it Egyptian royal authority or is it a local who's appropriating something that they've seen down in Thebes because they've been to Thebes and they've seen these tombs of the nobles and they've seen these um, funerary cones and they want something similar, but the only thing they know how to make is an Egyptian royal name. And the one they have is not Moses the third or Hatshepsut. So, so then there's no way of answering any of those questions. But what I have suggested is that this is a post-colonial, this is a hybrid object. This is something about an Egyptian social practice very much associated with the Theban um, elite um, and how they bury their dead, which is being reinvented in a colonial context by people who don't fully understand what it is that they're dealing with. They can't quite read the writing, but they know it's to do with Egyptian authority and they, they're using it somehow in Gaza. And sadly, we'll never know how they were using it in Gaza. So that's a sort of plenty of room for plenty of scope for further interpretation. So that was um, my first post-colonial foray. And more recently, I've been doing some work for a couple of archaeologists in the University of Heidelberg who are publishing a post-colonial archaeology of Egypt and they asked me to write something and I thought well I don't really want to revisit those so I thought well oh, Cyprus what do I know about I know about Cyprus and I thought well Cyprus is very much in contact with Egypt um, and it is very much part of this cosmopolitan world of the um, of the second millennium so can I do anything with post, um, through post-colonial theory here? And I thought, well, third middle ground works, but Homi Baba's third space maybe works a little bit better. But the third space is a sort of conceptual space. It's not a real space, but it's a space in which people come together and share ideas. And there is no sense of hierarchy there. There's no sense of one person imposing their will over another person. It's just a place where ideas mix and, and churn and, and meld. Um, so it opens up the possibility of cultural hybridity that entertains difference without an assumed imposed hierarchy. And I thought, okay, yeah, I can I, I can do that. That works for Enkemi. Enkemi, they're, they, they're playing around with the Egyptians. The Egyptians are going there, probably from the late 18th dynasty, from the Amarna period. And one of the earliest things we've got is Egyptian, in this respect, not the earliest, there are a few earlier things, is this um, amazing petrol which is found in the wealthiest tomb excavated by the British Museum in um, Enkemi. Uh, uh, Enkemi is a major trading centre on the east coast of Cyprus and the British Museum excavated there in the late 19th century and there's a beautiful array of objects in the British Museum, all of which are available online for us to study and some of my students know about because they've been doing so. Um, but this petrol really caught my attention and I thought this is a really important object nobody writes about it. Why does nobody write about the important objects? Why do people leave them to one side? So I started exploring it. The closest parallel to that comes from the Tomb of the Kings, the Tombs of the King in Thebes, dating to the Amarna period. No single other parallel to that has been exported to either the Levant or Cyprus, so completely unique. There is a lovely petrol similar to this from Lachish, but made out of faience. This one's made out of gold and enamel. This one is top, this is royal quality. The Lachish one is middle class, fiant sort of stuff that middle class people wear. So I thought, well, that's interesting. Um, so what's that doing there? And the other thing which really struck me, because again, it's one of those things that I didn't even know until I started hunting through the website, that that existed. The little tiny amulet, only about so high, made out of carnelian of the god Ptah. And well, okay, those are interesting objects. And what I found was that these have been used in a very specific way. The, unfortunately, the god Ptah hasn't got a, a context, so I don't know where he came from. But in Enkemi, they're not really engaging with Carnelian. They, they use it a little bit, but not much. Um, they love gold, but gold jewellery, Egyptian gold jewellery is quite rare. And, they, and when they do use it, they use fingering. So I thought, OK, you've got people here who've got access to this stuff and are actually choosing or being given stuff which they like and they use in a certain way, but it's not 
changing their material world. They're just using it, but they're using it in a very showy way when they're burying their dead. And I thought, again, this sort of takes me into a third space where you get a melding of ideas about how you adorn the body or um, how maybe you play with an amulet and do things, but it's not really necessarily um, changing the material world of the people who are doing it. They're just assimilating it into their material world. And I found that really fascinating to, to think about the stories that the further stories that we might play along with these. But that's my little foray into post-colonial archaeologies. Um, but where my real love affair is, is with materiality. And what I really focus on in materiality is how people's lives are shaped by the objects they use. And it's very much, for me, it's a very tactile relationship. It's how you make the object, how you form something out of clay or out of stone or whittle it from wood. Um, and then how the object gets embedded in your life story, how you acquire status maybe from owning an object, and how the object acquires a luster through its association with you. And you see this sort of recursive relationship between people and things. So um, it's a huge anthropological literature that I've um, used to sort of start exploring different ways in which people in the late bronze in, in Cyprus might have um, developed material worlds through the objects that they were making and using. Um, and here I just want to talk a little bit about a sort of very much more anthropocentric approach, how people give meaning and value to things. So it's very much people asserting their, world, their will onto the material world and the material world is working for us, which is the traditional approach. And I think the approach that we're all comfortable with, you know, we've got our mobile phones and, or our cars or other things which might project an identity about us, our status, our position in society. Um, and that's something that I think is really interesting. Um, but there are certain anthropologies that I find particularly fascinating. One of them is the idea of the object biography, that of an object having a life, having a story that it's made. And then you can tell the story of that object um, and it changes. It's not that it's born and it's used. It changes career as it moves through different stages of its existence. It becomes different things and it tells different stories and it means different things to different people who own the object, who handle the object, who use the object. And one object which really struck me as having a really interesting biography um, and really being an object that is physically embedded in people's lives is this object here, a stone that was found walled into a wall in a radio which you excavated. This was walled into a building that we've interpreted as a barn. You can see here the stones on either side of it and this is just a nice nice example of, of a, a stone that is walled in there and you might think well okay Louise that's a stone what is that stone telling you that's telling me something about a very interesting and quite intricate history it started life as a rubber and a rubber is the top part of a of the rubber and saddle quern grinding grain kit that you might see in sort of traditional images of the Near East a woman kneeling down in the ground with a saddle quern on her knees and she's pushing the stone against it to grind grain. So that is how the object started its life. And it seems to have had quite a long life of that. It looks sort of got a fairly worn surface. It looks like it's ground quite a lot of grain. And for those of you who want to know just how awful it must have been being a woman in the late bronze, a female job definitely, is on average, ethnographic studies have shown it takes between three to five hours a day to grind enough grain for the daily bread for the household. So three to five hours a day grinding, no wonder it looks so worn. It, is, it has had a, quite a long life and it's been broken. And I can imagine why it's been broken after three to five hours a day grinding grain. And sooner or later, you're just going to want to throw it at somebody or something. So it's, it's an object that is telling a story. And that's how it started its life. It's three to five hours a day grinding grain. Look to the contemporary societies in the Near East, in Mari, in, on the Euphrates, women as part of their diary were giving querns and grinding stones. And they, oh, thanks, <laughs> great, thanks. That's my life, is it? So this for me is a very visceral object. It's very much associated with maybe generations of women grinding grain with it over a long time and eventually it breaks. Well, what would you do when your grinding stone is broken? Throw it away? No, you turn it into a board game. 
So don't know if you can make out on there. There are lots of lovely depressions. Little, and there's three rows of, there should be 10 depressions. So can't really make it out here. And I'm hoping you can't really make it out here and do a quick count. But three rows of 10 depressions. This is an Egyptian game, a game called Senet. It means the game of passing. And the Cypriots have loved this game from probably the beginning of the early Bronze Age, and they have played it. The Egyptians have very fine sort of fancy wooden gaming sports and fancy little counters out of faience or bone or things. The Cypriots have great big lumps of stone that they make these gaming, gaming boards out of, but they play these games um, and it becomes an integral part of their life. And the other thing is a game not for just one person. It's not like playing solitaire or um, doodling away on, on your computer on a, on a card game on your computer. This is a game which is a game of talent and skill between two people. So it's an adversarial contact. Um, and there's been a, quite a lot of studies done um, about um, the playing games in Cyprus in particular. Um, but one of the things which really strikes me is if you go to Cyprus, um, the Near East, Turkey, Greece today and go to a cafe neon, men will be sitting there and they'll spend hours with one drink playing games together and it's it's a spectacle it's something that people watch so it's a it's a performance it's not so it's not just the game of wits between two people it's a game which incorporates a wider audience watching them can't demonstrate that for the late bronze age but i think well you know there is a social this is a social object it was an object which provided food for the family over generations maybe and then it becomes a game adversarial con conflict between at least two people maybe an audience watching them so I think oh this is an object that's actually developing quite an interesting life it's not just the stone it's just, it's telling us a story and sooner or later it gets walled into a building now with my archaeology head on I like to look at things like foundation deposits and deep and meaningful things Steve is my restraint when we're interpreting things in Cyprus. And he says, builders do this all the time. You put something meaningful in, you're building a wall, you put in a coin, you write the name of your daughter on the concrete, you 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 mark that, that thing, you as a builder. And it doesn't mean to say that it's esoteric. So at some point, that game passed out of being a game and became part of the foundations of a building. Um, and it's still in relationship with people. It's still doing something with the person who decided for whatever reason to put it there. Maybe they just finished playing a game on site and they didn't have enough stones and they walled it in. Maybe it's doing something a little bit more dramatic than that, but it's telling us again of this object telling a story. So that for me, for all that it's a stone, it's one of the most exciting and evocative objects that we excavated. Um, I'm not going to say too much about this lovely little lady on the other side. She lives in the Ashmolean Museum. And I met her a few years ago um, and she is something where I've been thinking more about sensorial approaches, how you handle and hold things. And I, I've quite fascinated. And some of you have been figurines for me in the past. I can see Chris there at the back being performed figurines. And I'm quite interested in how figurines tell us about the embodied experiences of, of in this case, of being a woman in, in late Bronze Age um, Mycenaean Greece. And, uh, and I came across a really interesting study about um, how gestures sort of evoke certain meanings and sensations in people. And I did a little pilot study of that, but I'm also interested in how these objects were handled and held and maybe um, the paint being worn away as they're sort of used repeatedly. These are objects that are embedded in people's daily life back in the Greek world. They use them in the settlement, they bury their dead with them. And they tend to put them at the entrance to houses, entrance to tombs or by the hearth. So there's a sense of them being quite protective, but there's also the sense of them being quite sort of mundane daily objects. So I, I, there's more that I can say about her, but I just put her in because um, I have spent quite a bit of time examining these objects and was fascinated by them. And last but not least is where I am now, what's happened to me in the last few years. <laughs> and this is really exciting. This is sort of where, where I'm really um, going with my research. Um, and I'm calling it here the new materialities, which is very much a lampeter take on the new materialisms. And new materialisms are a really exciting area of research in the social sciences and the humanities. It is 
everywhere you look now. Catherine mentioned to me today that you just come across new testaments and new, new materialisms. So it is really everywhere in the humanities. And what this does is it forces us to rethink who we are in the world and what we're doing. And from that perspective, it is really, really exciting and really challenging. And it really, I found it quite a quite an adventure, quite a, an exercise to get into the new materialism. So I find it very, it really did upset my understanding of the world. And the world has sort of been, here we are, and I, and I talk about things and I represent things and I discuss things. And it forced me to think, well, actually, no, you don't. You are part of the world. Um, and that is what the new materialisms do. It sort of takes us away from this idea of humans separate from the material world to placing humans as part of the matter of the world, that we are part of um, the matterings of everything around us, um, that we we create the world, we think we create the world, but what we're doing is that we're working with other matters and we're, we are shaping and we are being shaped by all the matters of the world. So we are not distinct from, but we are very much entangled within the matter of the world. And there's sort of two key approaches here. One, which I think is really interesting, just in terms of all researchers, something that maybe we should bear in mind, is Karen Barrett's um, A Gentle Realism. And in particular, uh, what she describes as her A Gentle Cut. And the moment you become aware of that, you think, yes, I've got to take this in, into consideration, because the A Gentle Cut is thinking about where you or I, as a researcher, where we choose to position ourselves, the questions we use, the approaches we take, the instruments that we choose to measure with, the measurements that we choose to take, sort of talking in a sort of, sounds like a very measuring sort of thing, and qualitative as well as quantitative, but how we are part of the research that we produce, that we're not separate from it. And if we ask different questions, we'll produce different research. And that I found really an interesting way of thinking about the research that I do, because the questions I ask of the material have produced very different results of um, the stuff I've been looking at. But what really excites me is the idea of matter having agency, not just things having agency and objects having agency, but matter having agency. Um, and in particular, the idea of vibrant matter, which Bennett describes as the curious ability of inanimate things that animate, act, to produce effects dramatic and subtle. And this, once you start thinking down this route, you can't unthink it. It just sort of, sort of pervades your consciousness and you start sort of questioning everything that you do. Um, and it's something that I've been working on very closely with my colleague Lucia Taller, and we've got a um, book series with University of Wales Press. We've got two books out, one of which is Body Matters, um, where various people, interdisciplinary um, approaches to um, the human body as matter and substance um, and how, how this changes our understanding of being human. But where I've really personally taken it is with um, earthy matter with um, clay, because I started off with pottery right at the beginning, my lovely crater that I showed you with the wonderful horns of consecration on it. Um, and it is the, the clay um, of the late Bronze Age, which has formed a sort of constant throughout my, my archaeological career. And what I find myself doing is sort of thinking about how, how you work, you don't impose your will on clay when you work with clay. And I know this, I know this from personal experience because I have sat in a classroom with 30 students, each of a lump of clay for two hours. And I've tried for two hours to make one of those figurines that I showed you in the previous slide. And I ended up with a little bull figurine. It was not going to be a person for me. Whatever I did to it, it wanted to be a bull. And the clay told me what it wanted to be. Um, and you sort of think, well, that sounds like a really weird way of thinking about it. You can only do with clay what clay will let you do with it. Um, and I think people who work with wood will say similar things. And um, sculptors who work with stone will tell you that the sculpture is waiting to emerge from the stone. So I've played around a bit, a little bit, look, or explored these ideas a little bit with this type of object here. That's a base ring bull. Um, base ring is a type of pottery that the Cypriots made in the late Bronze Age. And it is a tour de force in ceramic excellence. It might just look like a little bull. Um, this is one example of a whole series of things that they made out of this very, very plastic clay. It's a clay that is so plastic that you can't throw it on the wheel. It hasn't got the 
tension to be able to be spun on the wheel, but they were able to form it into various intricate shapes, jugs which stand up to, I think the largest one I've seen is almost a metre high, but which are two millimetres thick, and which then have a very shiny surface and very delicate um, decoration applied to them. So we're looking at a clay that is allowing people to make it into various wonderful shapes and things, um, and these Cypriots make their cosmological world out of it as well. They make um, little figurines of people and little figurines of bulls. And what I found is when I started looking at this, um, not as potters making things out of clay, but the vibrancy of the matter of the clay, it sort of answered quite a lot of questions that I'd had with this and it allowed me to explore the clay in, in new directions. So, so the, the vibrancy in, of, of the clay um, and other so-called inanimate things is something I find um, fascinating and something that I'm exploring at the moment and I am hoping, um, Lucy and I are publishing a couple of new books, one of which is called Earthy Matters, so I'm hoping to get some of these ideas out in there and I'm also exploring with an artist from South Wales a project looking at earthy matter, um, these perspectives I have about how we became human through our ability to manipulate clay, to shape clay, to fire clay, to work with it. Um, and she's looking at um, the sort of the clays and the coal tips in South Wales. And so we're looking at setting up a project with other people taking these ideas of earthy matters and vital materialism further forward. So that's the next stage in the, the adventure. And that is my archaeological odyssey. So thank you very much. Well, uh, that was a fascinating uh, journey you've taken us uh, along this afternoon, uh, a real adventure. Um, and on your behalf, uh, here in the Founders Library and also uh, in the virtual room, can I thank you very much indeed for such Man. an enlightening and uh, illuminating lecture this afternoon. Thank you very much and for sharing your, your scholarship with us. Once again, thank you very much. So I'm sure Professor Steele will uh, take a few questions this afternoon before we leave the, uh, the lecture. So uh, any questions? And uh, those of you uh, at home or at your office desks, please use the chat facility. And I'm sure our will will keep an eye uh, on any messages coming in uh, through that particular uh, avenue. Right, so any questions? Don't disappoint me now, come on. <laughs> we have a question. Evie. So, so you've told us a little bit about what you're doing now. And been nothing about the modern journey to now. Um, have you got some sort of plans beyond the new materiality work? Oh, I've got so many plans, Evie. I, I have left out so much. <laughs> well, I think you're, I think you're on the spot to make a wish. Yeah. So it. Well, um, I, I want to get my publication of Eredio out, which means having to go back to Cyprus for one last visit, well not one last visit to Cyprus, hopefully many more, but one last review focus visit um, and really get my thoughts out there on, on what the site, site was and what it was doing. Um, there, there's so many exciting things. I want to I want to publish the Gaming Stone in its own right. So I've been trying to the the stuff of earthy matter that I want to look at. There's there's so many different adventures that I want to go on. There's stuff I'm working on in gender archaeology and um, and the materiality of gender archaeology. So there, there's so many different avenues. I, I think I've left out more, so much more. You, you, you know, if I put everything in, we'd be here in about three weeks' time, probably. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, definitely more on Cyprus, but the new materialisms is, is really just shaping the, the, the questions I'm asking. I think, but also always objects, always objects. Thank you, Evie. Any other questions? Kristen. Um, given that your laundry work is in uh, contested landscapes, I suppose a lot of people's claim to lands is based on a particular sort of historical narrative on mm -hmm. people. And given that your was looking for evidence of that mm -hmm. history. So your work then becomes potentially politically powerful. Yeah. I wondered how you negotiate those difficulties, especially when you're you're working with people who whose narratives you might either sort of support mm. or refute. That's actually a really good question, and I, I think um sadly to say in, in um Gaza I haven't really got a good answer for that. I th I think um 
Gaza, the political narrative was, there was a strong political narrative, but um, I don't know that our research is really feeding in into that. Their, their narrative is very much that we are part of the land. This is our home. We've always been here and we know how to live with this land and new, new incomers do not know how to live with this land. So that, that's very much a landscape narrative that was going on in um, with Palestinians when I was there. In Cyprus, there is a very strong political narrative as well. It's about the, the Greek identity of the island um, and how long the island has been Greek and how um, certain aspects of material culture demonstrate that. And I think what I've learned from working in Eredu is it, it was very easy to as a young, arrogant British archaeologist going over there to be quite dismissive and saying, no, it doesn't say that. But actually say, well, actually, no, that this, this is a narrative and this is an understanding you have of you, your heritage. And I, I got to learn to listen to that and I got to learn to accommodate it or say, well, there's all other ways of looking at it. And I, I think that's a really, really good question. And it, it's a difficult one. It's an uncomfortable one, actually, sort of going as a British archaeologist to these parts of the world because you know, we are part of the oppression of that part of the world. You know, you just go to Gaza or you go to, to Cyprus and you, you realise that, you know, that there, there are strong sort of reactions to the fact that the islands, the island was controlled by the British. And so, you know, the British Museum collection, you know, so why isn't that in Cyprus? So, you know, that, so I think I think you've just got to be accommodate and you've got to listen, always got to listen to. Um, and in Eresi, we spent a long time listening to people long time talking to people and listening to them and and also explain I remember we we always used to have a end of season party in a, a museum display and I remember talking to the mayor's wife um, after one occasion we had excavated this tomb this beautiful Mycenaean imported jug um, little vessel that we found there and and I was explaining to her about how old it was and where it had come from and what it was used for and um, and how it's different to everything else that we had on the site. And she turned around and she said, well, people always told us that we were Greek and we've been Greek since such, and I, I've never really sort of understood it. And I thought, well, I hope I haven't actually said something that gives the wrong wrong interpretation, you know? So I you know, try and, I think trying to step back um, and trying to listen, which is of course very hard for an academic, isn't it? <laughs> yes. one, uh, one final question. Actually, said, so I sort of think uh, what, what got you interested in archaeology? So you've got this fascinating person who comes across quite exciting, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. But you have been actually, what, what got you interested oh, in I became an archaeologist about the age of three with the <laughs> little boy lived down the road from me. His father was an archaeologist, and behind where we lived, there was this um, fields at the time, and there was a ruined Victorian mansion. And we were convinced that we had found a Roman villa because we saw his dad coming back and he'd been excavating medieval stuff and his mother would be sitting down washing medieval tiles. And so we'd come back with bathroom tiles from the villa and we'd sit down at the kitchen table and wash those. So so it's really that. And I, I don't know, I ever, ever looked back. I started off at three, <laughs> carried on there on in. Um, and I've actually, I think I've become more of an anthropologist than all that than an archeologist. I'm, I'm very much more interested in the people now than it was the things. I'm very much more interested in people, but yeah, three-year-old excavating a Roman villa. <laughs> I just check with Alan, any, any comments and questions on the chat facility? There's lots of comments coming <laughs> here. Um, but I'm going to read one comment out because I think you mentioned this person at the beginning of your talk, mm -hmm. from Christine Barsley. Mm -hmm. uh, and she said, wonderful Gaza memories. I recall how thrilling it was when Louise and Joanne showed me a cartouche they had excavated, which I think dated back from the reign of Antoine III, really brought it home how that land had always been contested. Mm -hmm. And there's one okay. question as well from Gabby Moon. Um, how does a space or place moving to the middle ground or third space impact the agency of matter? Can we separate its actions as a human object interaction changes? Is the idea of meaning diluted with time to pass? Oh, that's a, that's a tricky question. <laughs> oh, I'd say maybe thinking about matter removes you away from representation. That's the uh, that's the um, new materialist approach. But yeah, that's a really good question. And I think I think it forces you to rethink it. Always rethink what you're doing in space and place. 
Um, so I'm, I'm going to sidestep that one because that's just a bit scary and large. But uh, Gabby, let's have an email conversation and <laughs> see, see where we go with that. <laughs> Thank you. Well, a uh, professor uh, at Goldsmiths University of London began his inaugural lecture a few years ago with the following comments. The words professorial inaugural lecture don't sound like the most inviting of reasons for coming out on a Monday night. Well, I'm sure that you'll agree with me. It was a pleasure and a privilege to be here uh, this afternoon, this Wednesday afternoon here in, in Lampeter, where you've so effectively shared with us a flavour of your intellectual activity and, and research. And, you know, having met people like Saskia, uh, these students have benefited greatly from your scholarly activity. And I know Saskia mm -hmm. is on her way to Scotland to become an archaeologist, and so the, the others, of course, mm -hmm. in, in the classroom as well. So we wish you well, and we thank you, uh, Louise, so Professor that. Steele, mm -hmm. for a fantastic uh, uh, lecture this, this evening and very, very grateful to you indeed. And having now negotiated, successfully negotiated this trial and this rite of passage, I'd like to uh, invite you for a cup of tea and, and some light <laughs> respect, and I also invite you as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.